I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about Norton versus Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, a U.S. Supreme Court case from 2004 about the definition of agency action for purposes of judicial review. Now, for my students, I, um, I want to explain, situate this case in the course. This is in our section on um, the availability of judicial review. And after Heckler v. Cheney, um, the court had held that there is no judicial review for agency inaction, at least related to refusals to enforce um, regulations or a, a lack of enforcement. It, it, they left open the possibility of maybe in an extreme case, but most of the time you can't compel an agency to enforce a statute um, as much as you would like or, um, or to enforce their own regulations. Um, then in later in Massachusetts versus EPA, which came after the case we're about to talk about, the court distinguished that from regulating and said, um, you can in some cases compel an agency to um, regulate or to be more precise, we can have judicial review of an agency's refusal to regulate in an area. Now, this looks a lot like Massachusetts versus EPA. This is an agency, the Bureau of Land Management, refusing to regulate um, those all-terrain vehicles um, tearing around in uh, federal parklands, right, and wilderness preserves and stuff like that. And the agency wasn't doing anything, and a group was trying to uh, force them to, and the court said, sorry, there's no agency action, so there's no judicial review. Now, one way to read this together with Massachusetts versus EPA is that Massachusetts versus EPA came later and is the latest word on the subject and that we have a new development or a new rule um, and which it calls this case into question. Another way to read it though is to say that it's a different statute than we had in Ma Massachusetts versus EPA and as we look at it you're going to see it doesn't have the same strong mandatory language for the agency and the issue that um, the stakes aren't as high. Um, so we have a different statute, a different agency, and a different problem, um, which could mean that the real answer about a judicial review of agency inaction is it depends. So let's look at what happens in this case. Um, the dispute here, again, is over a conservation group called the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, or SUA, trying to force the Bureau of Land Management to regulate the use of off-road vehicles, um, which the opinion calls ORVs. Um, I usually hear people call them all-terrain vehicles in certain protected parklands or wilderness areas. <clears throat> the case illustrates an important limitation on judicial review of agency in action. Um, the challengers claim that the agency failed to take or refused to take action with respect to these off-road vehicles and parklands that it was required to take, and they wanted the BLM to promulgate regulations, so basically to ban them. Um, the Supreme Court said that th there's really nothing here for the court to review that the agency did that they really needed to identify um, agency actions that the agency failed to take. In other words, specific um, things that the agency is refusing to do instead of just kind of delaying any action in this area indefinitely. Inaction, in other words, does not always take the form of an officially declining to prosecute a specific enforcement action or denying a rulemaking petition. And that they hadn't done that here. They just hadn't taken any action. So in that sense, maybe this is different from Massachusetts versus EPA in that we have a less formal um, a decision, right, from the agency. In Massachusetts, the EPA was saying, we refuse to regulate carbon dioxide emissions. And here, the agency was basically unresponsive. So <clears throat> the plaintiffs did try to identify three inaction um, claims. <clears throat> First, they said that, the, um, that allowing the use of off-road vehicles in certain wilderness areas meant that the BLM had failed to fulfill their obligation 
under Section 1782 of their statute, um, their enabling statute to quote, manage wilderness lands in a manner so as not to impair the suitability of such lands for preservation as wilderness. And so that's our statutory mandate. And the question is, is that clear enough that the agency actually has a duty to regulate recreational vehicles specifically? And SUA says it does, and the court disagrees. <clears throat> Secondly, the, um, the BLM wasn't implementing the agency's own land use plan, which had committed the agency to develop some kind of program over the next several years from when they, uh, they made the plan to monitor o ORV use, record damage, and make recommendations for corrective actions. Now, again, if you look at that quote that I have on the screen, that's not exactly a commitment to promulgate a ban or a regulation. It looks like they're sort of saying they'll look at the problem and maybe make recommendations. But <clears throat> again, this isn't the statute. This is more of like the agency setting out it, their goals for the coming years that the court decides is not legally binding. Um, the third allegation from SUA was that the BLM had violated NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, um, for, which requires that agencies complete an environmental impact statement. This has come up a few times in my administrative law class, and it's a whole unit if you take an intro to environmental law. Um, they said that um, the, uh, the BLM should have to supplement its existing environmental impact statements regarding um, new information about how much damage ORVs were doing on public lands, the increased usage, and so forth. And the court found each of these was non-reviewable. First, it said that the enabling statute was too general to support judicial review of the BLM's exercise of discretion in deciding how to manage wilderness lands. I hope um, if you're really paying attention, you catch a little bit of tension here with the intelligible principle idea from the non-delegation doctrine, um, which was basically saying there should be enough in the statute to tell the agency what to do and how to do it for a court to review it. And then here we have the court saying, well, well there's no judicial review because the statute isn't clear enough about what the agency is supposed to do. But maybe it's just about this specific thing. I do want you to recognize though that um, th this is a little bit of a paradox. The court concluded that the statute did not mandate any specific actions that would support invocation of the judiciary's APA authority to condemn, to compel agency action unlawfully withheld. In other words, even though there is guidance in the statute, so let's assume for a moment, this isn't a non-delegation case, but assume that there are some intelligible principles there. Um, there's not enough to say that the agency not regulating these recreational vehicles is um, unlawful, is a, a clear violation of their statute. <clears throat> now on the second claim, the court um, draws a misfeasance, nonfeasance distinction, or depending on who you had for criminal law first year, um, act versus omission. They acknowledge that proactive agency action contradicting a land use plan might be unlawful, and that might have been set aside under APA 7062A, which allows courts to hold unlawful and set aside agency action not in accordance with the law. So if the agency had um, adopted a land use plan and then was doing something expressly prohibited by it, that would be one thing, but instead they just weren't really fulfilling all of its aspirational goals. So in contrast here, the provisions in the BLM's land use plan merely projecting future actions were not legally binding commitments. And so a failure or refusal to perform an anticipated action did not trigger judicial authority under 7061 to compel an agency action unlawfully withheld. I want you to notice, by the way, how grounded this is in the language of the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act itself. On the third claim by SUA, which is the NEPA claim, the court did not dispute that there's reviewability, that there's judicial review under NEPA. That's uh, kind of undeniable. But it said that what they're really asking is for the BLM to revise an existing environmental impact statement 
um, for a completed action because times and circumstances have changed. And NEPA doesn't really require that. They, um, the approval of the land use plan had been done before and we don't require under NEPA that agencies go back and um, revise prior environmental impact statements um, all the time as circumstances change or the world changes. <laughs> In other words, SUA might have stated an actionable claim if the BLM were proposing a new land use plan while using an old EIS from a previous plan, but that's not what was happening here. Um, so without any major federal action, that's what NEPA requires, on which to focus, the agency had no ongoing obligation to keep an old EIS environmental impact statement up to date. The court's evident reluctance in this case to police agency passivity um, resonates also with the court's standing jurisprudence of the 1980s and early 1990s, where it was a little backing off from um, kind of looking over the shoulder of the agencies all the time. And so lawsuits challenging agency inaction as unlawful seem to run headlong into an intensifying judicial concern about those limits on standing that are supposedly rooted in Article Three. In other words, a lot of times these cases falter just on standing grounds before the court even gets to the question of defining agency action or inaction. Here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. Assuming that an agency's enabling statute does not use mandatory language about creating specific regulations, is an agency refusal or delay in promulgating a regulation an agency action for which parties may obtain judicial review? A, yes, or B, no. Now, you may need to read this question again. That's kind of a mouthful. If you don't know the answer, then I think you missed the point of this case and should rewatch the video. And that concludes our lecture about Norton versus the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance.